Our guest on today's program is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, former editor of Newsweek, frequent contributor on matters historical, religious, and presidential. His latest book, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, is available online and in bookstores. He was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a Southern boy. Meacham graduated summa cum laude with a degree in English literature from the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. I should say that's John Meacham. He's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times Book Review, and we could spend the next half hour with all of his credentials. But he's in the area today as a guest of the WKU Cultural Enhancement Series. When Outlook comes back, a conversation with John Meacham. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to Outlook. I'm Barbara Deed. Our guest on the program today, John Meacham, who has been called one of America's most prominent public intellectuals. And before we, thanks, welcome for being here. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I, I don't know who did that. But I don't, do you believe your be. own press? No. 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 That's the beginning of wisdom, not believing your own press. <laughs> I love that. Well, welcome. We're Thank glad you. that you're here. But with a title like that, I said it's amazing your head could fit through the, the studio door. It, I, it, believe me, I have a, a wife and three children who make sure that the, the, the air gets out of the balloon pretty fast. The great humbling. But with that, I mean, to be a prominent public intellectual means that you make a difference, that people are going to tune in to hear what you have to say. So, gee, you really have to think about what you're saying unless you want to have to fight the, fight the ramifications. So talk a little bit about that, what that means in this, this day and time, to have that kind of influence. Well, I don't know if I have any influence. I'm uh, very blessed and fortunate to be able to do what I do. Uh, as you said, I grew up in Chattanooga, went to Sewanee, uh, was fascinated by journalism early on because it was the only thing I could find where I could both be dealing with words and writing and with politics, which I think is the great human comedy uh, in the purest sense, Some, most, sometimes a real comedy, but, uh, but a great drama and a great story and how we decide who we are and what, what direction we're heading in collectively. And so I really just wonder, I hope at some point no one's going to make me actually work for a living. Uh, this is just, <laughs> Still a, getting paid to this do is you just, love, huh? this is great fun. And, uh, and I do believe that the past is important. I think that the, as Churchill once said, the future is unknowable, but the past should give us hope. And I think that it's not that there's a direct line between, oh, if we could do everything that FDR did, we would be X or Y. But if we know that people in the past overcame seemingly insuperable obstacles, then maybe we can have a little more faith and confidence in ourselves to overcome what seems insuperable now. Almost like putting in some kind of context for, well, for understanding. Well, I think of it as lowering your blood pressure. <laughs> that if, seriously, that if you understand, people yeah. say, oh, we've never been more partisan, we've never been more divided. Well, the Civil War was pretty bad. You know, Joe McCarthy, not a great moment. So I, I do think that context is important and it just it enables you to watch the news or read the news with a sense that, you know, every day is not the apocalypse. And that, that's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment to move forward. As we look at where we are today, you know, before we started taping, I was uh, suggesting to you that things have changed so much in the business that we do. Yep. And, you know, we have a lot of young people who are studying and aspiring to do just that, and yet sure. the landscape is not as it was. So, you know, what do we say to them as they move forward? I think everybody should keep reading, keep working, keep reporting, keep writing, keep broadcasting, and let the business settle itself out. Uh, the economic tumult of the hour is as significant as the era after Gutenberg. I sometimes feel like a monk who did illuminations and then the printing press came in. Uh, but I think that if people know how to create great content, a word we didn't use, uh, right. but which is now uh, t the way people think about it. If you know how to do that, if you know how to tell stories, if you know how to get people to talk to you, if you have, if you know enough history to apply perspective to the present, whatever it may be, those skills will always be marketable. We don't know what that market's going to look like, but it'll work itself out as, uh, as the next couple of years come along and then it'll be that way for a little while and then it'll change again. That's right, probably just like that. So it's the, the delivery system too, in, like you're saying, once that platform sort of levels and we decide how we're going to best tell that story. 
Well, we have to figure out how people, what the economics of this are. Uh, you so know, we're down to economics? Well, down to is tricky. I mean, you know this, a free press is, needs a market strength, needs, uh, needs to be able to stand on its own, own two feet. I think that, you know, for years, for centuries, uh, century and a half, I guess, newspapers, broadcasting, it was all advertising deliveries, right? Uh, it was financed by the selling of access to the airwaves or the publication, whatever it is. And that's just changing because how people consume news content is changing so rapidly. And it'll all catch up eventually. Now, in your role as a former editor of Newsweek, and you're a contributing editor at Time, I mean, that's a big responsibility because you're trying to target, it is dollars and cents, it's a market-driven, you know, mm -hmm. business. You know, how do you get to the most people, right? That's what you want. You want the most people reading, scanning, doing whatever, but consuming what you're giving them. Right. You want, I think you want to be true to your mission and then make sure your execution of that mission reaches the widest possible audience. And so we're now in an interesting, I, th I think a fascinating moment where we have the capacity, anyone has the capacity, the one single person has the capacity to speak at the same platform with the same volume as any network, as any magazine, as mm. any, any you just, if you have something and you're on the World Wide Web, you're there. And if you attract the right number of eyeballs, suddenly you're, you're in that league. And that's terribly exciting. It's terribly disconcerting. Frightening, downright to a lot, frightening. To a lot cases, of folks. Yes. And how do you sustain that? How do you create a, a world where people can get information, people can get information they can count on? And that's, that's the great question. And that's why I would just say to anyone studying, anyone thinking about any of these businesses, any of these careers, just read books, learn how to report, learn how to write, and all shall be well. And all shall be well. And we're going to take a short break with John Meacham when we come back. And we're going to talk about his new book, Thomas Jefferson, when Outlook continues right after this. Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're talking with John Meacham, author, historian. And as I mentioned earlier, if we went through all his credentials, we'd run out of time. So we're just going to leave it at that. But you know, you've authored a new book about Thomas Jefferson. You've written about several presidents, several leaders. I'm always curious. You, you were telling me a short while ago that you had the opportunity to interview Colin Powell at Belmont University in Nashville. I mean, these are, these are leaders of today. These are the men calling the shots. What does it mean anymore to be a leader? I mean, do you see some defining qualities in these people that you come across? Sure, and I think that, I think these are people who are absolutely committed to some principled vision, but who, if they're successful, are willing to depart from dogma as they need to. And that's what Jefferson did, that's what Franklin Roosevelt did, that's what Winston Churchill did, that's what Andrew Jackson did. And I think that successful politicians, political figures, public figures, are those who manage to balance this idea that there are some things on which they will never compromise, but they are willing to adapt to changing circumstances. It's one of the great political questions, actually, uh, one that's unfolding even now. At what point is a candidate or someone a hopeless flip-flopper or someone who's data-driven and changes his or her mind as circumstances change? I suspect the difference is whether you agree with that person or not. Exactly. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting and uh, perennial question because so many politicians do find themselves tailoring positions as, as the years go by. And to what extent is it, you know, I've changed my mind because mm -hmm. I've considered it or I've changed my mind because voters want X or Y. But whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, depends less, it seems to me, often on the person doing the switching and what we make of that switching. What about social media and how it's affected campaigns? You know, the money that it takes to run a campaign these days. And yes, you can have a very grassroots campaign where you don't have to spend any money if you get, you know, get the right mm -hmm. message out there. Mm -hmm. It's just really that uh, dichotomy there. It helps to do both. President Obama taught us that. Uh, he was phenomenally well organized in 2008. In fact, that was 
remember he won Iowa, which is what really put him on the, on the road. And that was a very granular kind of, of campaigning and, and marketing, but that too is expensive. You know, it, it's, it's uh, sometimes grassroots are really astroturf. <laughs> and not without cost, right. yes, definitely. Let's talk a little bit about Thomas Jefferson. I have interviewed lots of people in my time, but would love the opportunity living, well, I'd hope that he would be living, but Thomas Jefferson, love to have a conversation with him. I'll and put why? in a good word. Will you do it next time you talk to him? <laughs> but I mean, this is, the, this is the Renaissance guy. This is the guy that did it all. Architecture, you know, design, mm -hmm. politics, smart guy. Mm -hmm. Wow. He may have been the most interesting American who ever lived. He was a statesman of the first rank. He was a writer of the first rank. He was an interpreter and um, translator of culture from the old world to the new. He was a ferocious defender of the American experiment against enemies foreign and domestic. He loved architecture. He loved wine. He loved food. He loved women. Uh, he was a sensuous and um, connoisseur of, of almost everything life had to offer. And what a beautiful gift to have been given. And yet, as a result of that being, you know, he gave us many gifts. What did you learn in the research that you did about him? That, he, he, as driven by appetite and ambition as he was, he was able to stick to a principled vision that the American Revolution was a world historical event, that it was an epic in human affairs that had to be protected and perpetuated. And it was such a fragile thing, we forget this. I mean, it all seems sort of like the march of time now, sure. and, and uh, I sometimes think that the founding should not be seen as a historical antidepressant. You know, the, 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 these were very, very provisional, very close calls. And Jefferson, for 40 years, from 1769 to 1809, when he left the White House, for 40 years, by and large, he was in public office or thinking about public office. And he was someone who made it his profession and believed in the art of compromise, believed in the pursuit of power in order to be in the arena be, be a figure of great historical importance. That was not far from his mind. So he did aspire to be a, a figure of historical proportions. Yes. But, so was there a genuineness? Was there some kind of altruistic reason? Sure, that he, yeah. sure. He could have had a very good life uh, on, his, on his plantation, uh, served by slaves, making money. Uh, but he believed that the public sphere was where you made your mark and where your, your legacy was created and worried obsessively about his reputation. I mean, the idea that politicians only recently started worrying about the press is hilarious. Would uh, he have been able to survive in, in th these lights? <laughs> oh, I think so. I think he would have been just fine. Savvy kind of guy? Uh, I think every great political figure masters the means of communication of their era. And so Jefferson uh, was a brilliant newspaper manipulator. Uh, in the same way Franklin Roosevelt understood radio and JFK and Ronald Reagan understood television. It's, it's just a key part of political and public leadership to understand how to talk to people. And Jefferson believed in a, in a constant conversation with people. Remember, he was, we think of him as this very, which he was, this yes. sort of rich, you know, aristocratic figure, uh, which is true. But in context, he was the populist. He was the person who wanted to make sure that people, the people, continued to have a voice in public affairs, whereas Alexander Hamilton, and I do like to point out that at least my guy didn't get shot in Jersey, <laughs> uh, Alexander Hamilton was more interested in the British system. Well, that's true, and I want to talk a little bit more about Thomas Jefferson, bin Laden, and a few others. And recently, you were featured on National Public Radio, and someone wanted to know what you thought or who you thought might make the better babysitter for your kids, President Obama or Mitt Romney. We're going to talk about that. Right. When Outlook continues with John Meacham right after this. Outlook continues our conversation with author, historian John Meacham. Before the break, we were talking about his latest book, Thomas Jefferson, and you, were, you really shared 
some and shed some light on the man that was Thomas Jefferson because we all think of him in a certain way but you came to find out that there was a lot more to him as you fleshed out this book mm. how do you do your research because you know there's a lot out there about Thomas Jefferson but how sure. do you be the guy that has something a little bit different a little bit more sure I think every generation rewrites history and I think that whenever you explore a great and consequential life your angle of vision shifts depending on the problems of your own time, uh, just inevitably. I, I read all of Jefferson's uh, papers, which are still being published. Wow. Uh, I think they're up to volume 38 and was just the second year of the presidency, something like that. And then the folks at Princeton at the Papers Project were very kind and gave me their presidential papers uh, that are still to come. And it's really a case of trying, for me anyway, of trying to put yourself in, in his worn down slippers, which he wore in the White House to upset people. Uh, there was a British diplomat who always thought he was being dissed and, uh, and wounded by the fact that Jefferson would show up quite slovenly, which was probably the most calculated thing Thomas Jefferson ah. did. Uh, but I think you have to be with them. I think, I believe that the more we can make clear that in this case, he was a man before he was a monument. The more educational, the more illuminating, uh, the more instructive he can be. What can we learn from him now as we approach this upcoming presidential election? Is there something we, we can take away from him? I think so. He was, be he was better than the modern day folks at uh, talking about disagreeable truths. In his inaugural address, he came out of a very rough campaign and he said, I know you all don't like me. <laughs> I know there are a lot of you who don't want me here, but we are all brethren of the same principle. We're all Federalists. We're all Republicans. So he acknowledged the elephant in the room and, nice. and, and pressed forward. I think the, uh, the sense of a constant political conversation, that politics is not just for election times, but that you have to keep people engaged. Uh, he once said that people are not participators only once every four years, but every day. In a, in a democracy and that, that ongoing conversation. And the insistence on clarity, you know, he, again, he was a writer mm -hmm. and he knew how to articulate the fundamental, the underlying questions that he wanted to address, agree or disagree, but he, there was a certain clarity about his expression that is not uh, widely shared today. Are we at a crossroads today? You've been doing this We're always a at a while. fork and take the fork. I think I'll take the fork. <laughs> but you know, we hear so much of that and we yeah. can't go back. You know, these, these definitive statements sure. where sure. there's no gray. 1801, uh, Thomas Jefferson is challenging John Adams. Uh, Jefferson was the vice president, so that shows you how well everybody mm -hmm. got along. It was seen as a revolution. You know, Jefferson framed the campaign as you can have me and the Republican promise of the country, or if you have John Adams, you will go toward Britain and perdition. It was to be an existential, apocalyptic crossroads. I'm yet to find a presidential election where anybody didn't argue that, mm -hmm. and that's okay. I mean, that you, they frame the choice starkly, and we make, we make the choices we make. What I think is important, and what I think Jefferson shows us is that once you come out of that crisis, once you come out of that storm, there has to be a way to govern. And the idea that campaigns never end is a dangerous one. It is, it's one that may be inevitable and, and intractable now, but he was able to articulate again. He said, we're all, we disagree violently, but there are certain things we have to agree on and he did, in fact, uh, run for re-election with virtually no opposition and built a dynasty that from 1800 to 1840, for 36 of those years, either Jefferson himself or a self-described Jeffersonian was president of the United States, which is an unmatched dynasty. FDR didn't do it. Reagan hasn't done it. You mentioned uh, in the break we were talking about the fact that they came to you and wanted you to comment on who you would rather have take care of your children. Would it be President Obama or Mitt Romney? And you responded to National Public Radio to a national audience that you would instead have... Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower. 
Yeah, I was dodging the question. <laughs> Very effectively, as it's it turns visual, out. It's a visual, looking at Eisenhower taking care of your kiddos. Yeah. But you really weren't dodging the question. You thought he must have something. You would trust him with your kids? Yes, we trusted him with uh, our Cold War health, uh, the war and peace. And um, it's an interesting question. It's sort of, it's a little, it's a variation on the question eight years, uh, 12 years ago now, good Lord, of who would you rather have a beer with? You know, Al Gore, George W. Bush. It, it's sort of a silly question because you're, you're hiring a president not to drink with them, but to manage the affairs of an incredibly complicated, globalized world. So, but it, it we all pass the time somehow. So the babysitter question is, is a slightly interesting one. I will say this, I've, I've been lucky enough in my uh, uh, time around journalism to interview and talk to a lot of the men and women, uh, Senator Clinton, who were running for president in the past 12, 16 years. And after September 11th, I asked, the candidates in 2008 why I should trust them with the health and survival of my children because we were living in Manhattan at that time. And the person who gave me the best answer was Barack Obama. Hmm. And he came right back and said, because I have two daughters and I'm gonna protect them. And Senator McCain would have been a wonderful president. Uh, we were very lucky, I think, with that choice, with having that choice. That choice. But there is a kind of visceral, uh, again, humanity about all of these candidates that I think in the heat of a campaign we forget. You know, we, we get so wrapped up in our candidate, our candidate that the other guy is, is you know, just hopeless and, and, and un-American and all that. And that, that's, that's not healthy. You know, these, these are folks who are in the arena trying to serve, they could all be making more money doing something else. Uh, and I, I salute, one of my many character flaws is that I like politicians. Uh, I just think, I think they're all like, I think we're all like them and they're like us only more so. And you just can't make some of that stuff up. Exactly. That they do. You've written about Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, mm -hmm. um, Churchill, mm -hmm. Franklin. Do you have a favorite? I've also written about God. <laughs> and the, Do you have the, a the, only, the only similarity between all of these is that every other person I've written about thinks they're God. So mm. that, that actually holds it together. Ah, a favorite, no, it's like picking among your children. Mm. But I think that Winston Churchill was the warmest human being of, of the crew. And probably put them all together. You ask 10 people, they wouldn't have guessed that he was no, the warmest. No, no, they wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't. And um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, enormously effective, but not a not a terribly loyal friend, uh, a tricky figure. Um, Jackson, I mean, you talk about stuff you can't make up. Uh, I should have saved Jackson for my retirement because whenever he got mad at someone, he shot them. Oh, so the narrative is easy. Very easy when you think about yes. it. Yes, uh, he once said that his only regrets in public life, and I'm sorry to say this in Kentucky, is that he did not shoot Henry Clay and hang John C. Calhoun. Oh, yes. So, um, and they still talk about that in these parts. Well, they should. They should. They absolutely do. They, uh, they, 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 Clay never quite made it. Now, what are you working on? The new book, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, is available now. Right. Are you working on a book about former President Bush? I am. I'm writing okay. a book, a uh, biography of George Herbert Walker Bush. Yes. Uh, Bush 41. Okay. And uh, who is rep clearly represents a lot of the things we've been talking about. Very human. Uh, often misunderstood, defeated for re-election, chased out of town basically, low approval rating. Only 37% I think uh, of Americans wanted him to continue in office in 1992. And yet, in the last 20 years, a lot of the things he did that got him defeated in 1992 have turned out to be right. And I think people are coming to appreciate that. Well, we appreciate you coming and spending some time with us and sharing your insights. And the latest book by John Meacham, our guest on today's Outlook program, Thomas Jefferson. And we want to thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Come you. back and see us. Thanks. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deep. Thanks for being here.